Okay, so I just posted an announcement saying you'll see review slides, beginning of every lecture, trying to fish out some kind of questions from you guys. So if you have problems, um, that's the intent of these, trying to trick you into asking questions. Um, so most of the review sides will kind of slide through if nobody speaks up. So we've done hybridization. I finally decided to kill that slide so it's not in here anymore. This is your summary slide of everything to do with hybridization, VESPER models, that kind of fun stuff. Okay, so that's going to be a pretty important one to review over. We talked about functionality. We're going to look at um, some more functionality today, uh, looking at our acids and bases. Um, and a lot of it comes back to electronegativity. Okay, so our primary concern when we're going through and solving a lot of these problems is finding an atom that's partially positive and then finding another atom that's partially negative and somehow putting them together. Okay? The rest of the reaction is how that is actually facilitated. Because in some cases, we can't just jam them together because octet rules are in the way. Okay? We might end up exceeding the octet if we just jammed them together. Okay? So when we look at our electronegativities, I went through and summarized these high versus low. Um, we might push this even a little bit further and say typically we're looking at our low electronegativity elements typically carrying a partial positive charge. So if we're going to look at for reactivity and I ask you to find the most positive or the most negative atom, your most positive, most cases, is going to be your hydrogen and carbon. Okay? Your most negatives will be everything else. Yay, nice and simple, right? Okay. So you'll likely see a lot of those elements carrying our most negative charge. Okay. Um, in this situation, it's relatively simplified. We're only looking at individual atoms. Remember, we're looking at molecules when we move further on into the semester. So it's not going to be just a single atom, but lots of atoms. You're going to have to go through and rank them and decide which one's more positive, which one's more negative, which other factors contribute to the reactivity of that overall structure. Okay. So it's going to build upon this, so please get used to it, practice it, memorize it if you've got it. Um, we went through and looked at our intermolecular forces. There's a lot of questions with these. It's easy to get them kind of shuffled and confused, your bonds versus your forces. We went through and addressed the different bonds types, and I gave you some new rules uh, as far as classifying bonds relatively quickly according to general just rules as opposed to having uh, the strict differences in electronegativity memorized. Okay? That helps because then you can look at a structure and decide, yes, that's a polar covalent bond. If it's polar covalent, say a green polar covalent, okay, I can then translate that across my color wheel to the other side, and I'm now looking at some kind of dipole force. If I've got that dipole force, do I have the potential for hydrogen bonding? So I added that little special conditions. Hydrogen bonding is a special dipole-dipole. So the first thing we've got to see is do we have dipole-dipole? And then we can look for hydrogen being bound to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Okay? One of the things that can be deceptive with this is in a lot of questions, and it's not just the way I ask the questions, it's the way a lot of people ask the questions, is drawing up an individual structure. Say, let's pick benzoic acid because that has a lot of these things in it. I'm going to draw it a couple ways. We'll start with that. And then asking, uh, what's the strongest force in this compound? Okay, well, as we just discussed, asking what the strongest force in that is a bit deceptive. Okay, because the force is between what? Other molecules. Other molecules. I've only drawn one. Okay, but when I'm asking for that force, what I'm expecting you to do is to look at this molecule and identify the most polar bond within it, and then say, if it's in a solution or a mixture of other like molecules, what's the attractive force going to be? Okay. So you would go through and evaluate this structure based on the bond characteristics, okay. and you might go through and say, you know what? I've got some covalent bonds down in that carbon ring. All of those covalent bonds, we've got hydrogens out there too, um, aren't going to generate a very strong force. 
So we won't worry about those, but we could label them. Say, hey, yeah, those are London dispersion forces. Okay. We could take it a step further and then say, okay, what other bonds do we have in that compound? Okay, well, according to those handy-dandy rules that I threw out there, we said anything bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or halogen was polar covalent. Well, we've got two oxygens in here, so we've got a polar covalent bond here and here. Okay, there's a third one. Where's that third one? Between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Um, guaranteed you guys are going to be doing this abbreviation um, what we've done is typically imply that bond. It's a bit mean to do, okay, but it does get implied fairly often. We do have that extra bond in there. That bond is another polar covalent bond. Okay. Now that we've got our bond classes figured out, okay, we know we don't have any ionic bonds, which means we don't have to worry about our strongest ionic force we can now start to go through and say, what's our strongest force? Well, with polar covalent, I absolutely have dipole-dipole forces. That's stronger than London dispersion. Great. So that could be my strongest force. I'm just going to abbreviate D to D. Uh, or double D. Huh, even more fun. Um, we can take this a little bit further and say, once we've got the dipole-dipole force, do we have the prerequisites for hydrogen bonding? Okay. Go back to our rules. Do we have a hydrogen bound to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen? Yes, absolutely. That bond between the oxygen and the nitrogen, running out of good colors for this, but I'm going to try yellow. Kind of works. That bond is going to generate our hydrogen bonding force. It's probably a really bad color to use, huh? Let's try it orange. Okay, that gives us our hydrogen bonding force based on all of our other forces summarized. Hydrogen bonding is our strongest force. That's what we would identify for that compound. Okay. Does it still have dipole-dipole? Yes. Does that OH bond still have dipole-dipole? <laughs> yes. Does our molecule still have London dispersion forces? Yes, it is still out here. Does that OH bond still have London dispersion forces? To get London dispersion, what do we need? We need electrons. Does an oxygen-hydrogen bond have electrons? Yes. That bond, by definition, has electrons, which means this bond also exerts London dispersion forces. Why do we typically ignore it? Because hydrogen bonding is a lot stronger. Okay. Does that make sense? Depends on the question asked. If I asked for the strongest, what would you answer? Hydrogen bond. If I ask for all of them, you got to specify all three. Yeah. Okay. Technically, those aren't separate forces, though. Hydrogen bond and dispersion. None of these are separate forces. It neither it's, a more is category. it's just a category where we've got a difference in electronegativity or a difference in strength that's enough that we can say the extreme London dispersion force is different enough for my extreme dipole dipole force that I'm going to give them a different name. Okay. That's about it. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. So then we moved into our acids and bases. This is where we ended looking at stability, trying to determine weak acids and bases, okay, or weak acids. Um, that's pretty much the only thing I'll test on. I might throw in some more challenging questions looking at bases just to see how well you can apply the rules in reverse. Okay, if you take a look at quiz three, question three is a base question. Okay, it is an extremely hard question. Most students get it wrong. Okay. So work on it, see what you can do. Um, don't stress too much about it. See how you can apply it. Okay? So what are our rules for determining our acid strength? Okay. 
Rule one, we're concerned about size. Rule two is electronegativity. Rule three, induction. And rule four is resonance. Okay? As far as determining acid bait or acid strength, the rare exceptions all ask about resonance because resonance is such an important topic. I don't think I will ever ask about induction. Okay, we will look at an example of it just so that you can see what's going on, but I don't think I'm going to make specific examples of asking about it. Okay? These would be acids. What do acids react with? Bases. They're the opposites of each other. So if I'm going to look at base strength, okay, I want something that has electrons. Okay, so if we looked at a good base, what's your favorite base? Sodium hydroxide, good example. First doesn't work. First base? No. Come on, it wasn't that bad. Why would that be your favorite? Sorry. If we look at sodium hydroxide, if we look at sodium hydroxide, we get hydroxide with a negative charge. Okay? The negative charge is what makes this reactive. Okay? When we looked at acid strength, we were looking at trying to place our charge on the atom that could hold the negative better. So all about acid strength was looking at having a very stable negative charge. When we look to bases, what do we want? We want the opposite. We want to make that negative as reactive as possible. It wants to hook up with a hydrogen. Okay? So if we go through and look at size, down a column, our compounds get larger, which we said stabilize the charge. What's that going to do to our base strength? It's going to decrease it. We want to go to the smaller atoms. The smaller atoms are going to be more basic because that charge has nowhere to run. Okay? It's going to be reactive almost immediately. If we move into electronegativity, Okay, we said our stronger acids were further to the right or more electronegative. Okay, so when we get out of size, okay, what are we going to expect for bases? Less electronegative. Okay, because that atom does not want to stabilize that negative charge. It needs a hydrogen to react with. Okay, so it's applying the definitions kind of in reverse, coming up the best way you can do it. Same thing's going to happen with induction and resonance. Both of these methods draw electron density into the structure. If we want our species to react with something else, our electrons must leave the structure. So anytime electrons come into the structure, we're increasing stability, which means what about reactivity? We decrease the reactivity. Okay? Um... I'm not sure I directly said this. I've come up with this face test, which I know is completely politically in incorrect. Um, but if you're comparing two molecules and you're trying to decide which one's the stronger acid, okay, or which one's more reactive, which side of the reaction do we want to go to, we can pull kind of a face test. Okay? If we look at HCl versus HCl reacting with water, Okay, so if I'm going to look at an individual reaction here, both of these are going to be kind of nasty, so it's not going to be the greatest. But if we take HCl plus H2O, and we go to H3O plus, plus Cl minus. Okay. Which are you concerned about, water or HCl, if you pull a face test on it? HCl. We'd rather have water thrown in our faces. Okay, we can move over to the other side. Which would you rather have thrown in your face? H3O plus or Cl minus? Cl minus is also found in the tears after you take the exam. Okay, sodium chloride. It's not that big of a deal. H3O plus is still an acid. Okay, it's still a pretty strong acid. Okay? So when we look at the two sides of this reaction, the two things that we're concerned about okay, would be HCl and H3O+. Which way does our reaction go? So this is the most confusing or uh, 
not necessarily most confusing, but a new concept for those of you from 130. Chemistry is not unidirectional. It goes both backwards and forwards. So when we show a single-headed arrow going always to the right, it's not really fair. Okay? It's actually going to the right and... I got that right, didn't I? Yeah. Right and to the left. Okay? Which way do we want our arrow to go? If you're going to make something, do you want to make your products or do you just want to sit there with your reactants and have nothing happen? You always want to push towards the products. Okay? What's going to help a reaction go towards products? What can you tell me about the energy of your products in comparison to your reactants? Products should be lower in energy, more stable. Okay? If they weren't, what's going to happen? No reaction is going to stay right here. Okay? So a lot of the stuff that we'll do is assuming that it pushes forward. Okay, so almost everything I tell you is that it's pushing forwards, it's going towards the products. Okay, but we can look at it and try and decide, is that a reasonable assumption to make? Okay, chemistry is very similar to our face. It's going to push for the most stable thing to form. Okay, we want the least reactive thing splashed in our face. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, we said HCl was reactive and we said H3O plus were, were our reactive thing. What can you tell me about HCl based on what you memorized from Monday? Strong acid. It's a strong acid. Okay? Acids are bad. Strong acids are badder. I thought it was cool. <laughs> H3O plus. Not as strong an acid. Which are you rather going to have splashed in your face? H3O plus. Which way does our reaction lie? To the right. To the right forming our products, because we're going to form the less reactive thing. Okay? Just like you're choosing to not have as dangerous a thing splashed in your face. Does that make sense? That's kind of what the face test is talking about. We'll come back to that every so often. It's trying to apply um, something that we can kind of, suit, well, hopefully don't have directly ex experience with, um, but we get the idea behind to something that you can't really see. Okay? Um, where we ended lecture on Monday was looking at acetic acid. We started to look for the reactivity of it. Okay, and we drew up this structure. And we were trying to determine something about its reactivity. Okay, so if we're going to look at reactivity, what do we need to look for? Differences in electronegativity, which is ultimately going to lead us to charges. Okay, so we can go through and start to evaluate our structure here. Carbon to hydrogen, what kind of bond is that? Covalent. Okay. If it's a covalent bond, do we generate partial charges? No. Okay, so we won't worry about that bond. How about the carbon to carbon bond? Also covalent, we won't worry about that. Because I got a couple puzzle looks. Where's the carbon to carbon bond? There's our carbon to carbon bond. Right in the middle there, we have a single point. There's our carbon. So we won't worry about that bond either. And now I'm going to erase that. Okay. How about our carbon to oxygen double bond? That's a polar covalent bond, which means we're going to generate partial charges. Which atoms are going to be partially charged and what will they be? Oxygen should be partially negative. What will the carbon be? Partially positive. Okay. How about this bond? also polar covalent. So we get a partial negative and again a partial positive. Okay, so ooh, that carbon's looking really positive. Okay, that could mean it's extremely reactive. How about our last bond, our oxygen to hydrogen? It's also a polar covalent bond, also generating partial charges. Okay, we can get our partial negative. Sorry, that didn't look like a negative, but it is. 
and our partial positive. Okay. Let's try and decide if this is an acid or a base. Um, let's not do that. I want to look at the reactivity of the positives. Which positive do you think is more reactive, our carbon or our hydrogen? Now, this is a bit tricky. Our carbon has two oxygens attached to it. Both of those oxygens are pulling electron density away from it, okay, based on our differences in electronegativity. Okay, so that would suggest our carbon is incredibly positive and incredibly reactive. Okay, but it's not. The hydrogen ends up being more positive. Okay, and that's tricky to see at first. So what we're going to do is say it is positive and see what happens. Okay, if our hydrogen is going to be the positive, we'll have it react with something benign at first. Uh, I lied. Let's just take that hydrogen off. Okay? So if we're going to take that hydrogen off, where are those electrons going to go? With the hydrogen or with the oxygen? Why should they stay with the oxygen? Oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen. The electrons are going to stay with the oxygen. What's the product of that? What do we get? Did we do anything to the carbons and hydrogens? Nope. Or the carbon hydrogens at the end. We get CH3. Do we do anything to the carbon-carbon bond? How about the carbon-oxygen double bond? Do we do anything to the carbon-oxygen single bond? The carbon-oxygen single bond. Did we touch the carbon-oxygen single bond? Did anything happen to that bond? No. What did we touch? The electrons between the oxygen and the hydrogen. What did we do with those electrons? We put them on to the oxygen. So the oxygen has picked up an extra lone pair. Is the bond there anymore? Nope, it's turned into the lone pair. What happened to the hydrogen? It's no longer attached, and we would have H. Okay. What we've got drawn now are Lewis structures. The end of drawing Lewis structures, what do we need to do? You must assign formal charge. All right, so you can go through that formula, or we can start to apply some knowledge about what's happening with our electron transfers. Our hydrogen started at what charge? What formal charge? So partially positive is not a formal charge. A formal charge needs to be positive or negative. Zero. No charge. Okay. What happened as we went through this reaction? We take a look. It came in with an electron in that bond. Where did those electrons go? Away from it. So hydrogen lost electrons. What's the charge on an electron? Negative. We lose. What's the mathematical symbol for losing? Negative. Minus a negative charge gives us a positive. What's the charge on hydrogen? What happened to the oxygen? It gained electrons. It's now negative. Okay. And what we've done is now applied our knowledge and said, okay, our hydrogen was the one that was reactive here. Okay. If that's the case, I'm going to have to erase that hydrogen, we would expect that that oxygen, our negatively charged oxygen, should be relatively stable. Okay. So we could look at electronegativity. Okay, we said the stronger acids tend to be more electronegative. Well, our negative charge is on oxygen. How electronegative is oxygen? Oh, that's pretty good. Okay, so that's a good thing. What do we say about size? Smaller. Ooh, oxygen's pretty, or bigger is more acidic. This is pretty small. Okay, we could pull an induction rule here. What other atoms are attached to the, that oxygen? Our carbon here, which is attached to oxygen, which is more electronegative than carbon. What happens to the electrons in this bond? They go more towards the oxygen. What charge starts to build on the carbon? It starts to get upset. So what does it try and do? It starts to grab electrons from our negatively charged oxygen. And those start to shift towards it. So we could pull an induction argument on this. 
it's not very satisfying because we can't really draw any arrows. So what we're going to do is say, you know what, Oc carbon in the middle there, so frustrated that the electrons were taken away from, or that it's losing electrons, that it's going to start to take them from the closest source it can. Which oxygen is going to be the best source to get electrons from? Why would the three lone pairs? Why is it not as stable? It's not neutral. It's negatively charged. So let's take those electrons and we want to move them towards the carbon. How do we show that? We'll show it with an arrow. So we'll draw our arrow. Where should the head of our arrow be? Oops, I did that right. We can't take them immediately off an atom. To go off an atom and move it to another atom, we have to move through space. Electrons can't handle space. We can only move through the bonds. So we're going to show those electrons move from the oxygen atom to the bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Okay? Where's the head of my arrow? On the bond end or the atom end? On the bond end because that's where my electrons went to. How many electrons did I move incidentally? Two. Two. How many heads are on my arrow? One head there, second head there. Okay, I know that's kind of weird. Thankfully, we won't have to deal with that too much. I don't think we have to deal with radicals at all this semester. Okay, how many bonds would that carbon now have? How many bonds are in black shown to that carbon? Four bonds. What have I just done? I added two more electrons into that bond, which means five bonds. How many bonds can carbon have? Four. What we've got here is a pentavalent carbon and a Nobel Prize if you can prove you made it. Okay? You can't. Okay? So we have to break a bond. What bond do we break? Okay, why do we break the double on the oxygen? All sorts of fun reasons on this one. What was your answer? I was going to say this on the oxygen would be another lone pair. It can stabilize a lone pair. Why can it stabilize a lone pair? We'll come back to that statement in a second. What's that? So that's what I'm addressing here. We've got several bonds we could break. We can break this bond here or this bond out here, which kind of shows up in green. Our carbon-oxygen double bond or our carbon-carbon single bond? Why do we break the carbon-oxygen double bond? That is the correct answer. There's one good answer. The pi bond is easier to break. Why is the pi bond easier to break? Uh, not quite less energy, the opposite of that. The pi bond is highest in energy. Why is the pi bond highest in energy? What orbitals made the pi bond? Your p orbitals. If we look at that sigma bond, we're looking at a hybrid orbital, our s hybridization. Which orbital is higher in energy? Our p orbitals. Our pi bond is going to be easier to break than our sigma bond. Okay, so that's a really good, though esoteric, explanation of that. So that's good. Okay, that was the hard one. There's an easier one. Why do we not take the electrons between the carbons and carbons and push those to that carbon? That's true. There won't be a bond. There's still not a double bond. Maybe you guys are thinking too hard on this. Why is it easier to break the pi bond? We said the energy. Another big, easier answer. Which atom is taking the electrons? Oxygen versus carbon. Which one can take the electrons easier? Oxygen, because it's more electronegative. Okay, if someone said that, sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay? So it makes sense for us to break that pi bond for multiple reasons. Okay, so we can push those electrons out there. Since we've now shown electrons moving, we need to show what happened as a result. Did we do anything to the CH3? How about the carbon-carbon single bond? How about the carbon-oxygen single bond? How about the other carbon-oxygen single bond? It's kind of fishing for no's there. Did we actually touch the single bonds? No, we changed where the 
double bond or the pi bond in this case. Okay? What happened to, we'll come back to that in a second too, what happened to our pi bond with our top oxygen? Where did those electrons go? On to our top oxygen. What happened to our rightmost oxygen? What happened to the electrons there? They went into a double bond, so it lost a lone pair. We now have a Lewis structure. What do we need to end it with? Formal charge. There's our negative charge. Okay. So what's the relationship between these structures? What have we moved? Okay. Close with the charge. I didn't quite like charge, but it's very close. What charge did we move? A negative charge. What makes negative charges? Electrons. We moved electrons, and we moved electrons from lone pairs into pi bonds, and pi bonds into lone pairs. We never touched the sigma structure. What's the relationship between these two structures? Resonance. Okay. What we have shown is a pair of resonance structures. What does that mean about the stability of these structures? Okay. Neither of these structures accurately reflects this molecule. Okay? We need to look at both of them simultaneously. How easy is it to do that? Yeah, funny faces is probably a good response. It's not easy to do. So that's why we end up averaging them out. And we have to start to acknowledge some side effects of averaging them out. Okay? What's the most reactive part of this structure, of one of our molecules? Oxygen, which oxygen? The one with the negative charge, right? So what's the charge on that oxygen? Negative one, right? Remember, we said we had to take the average of both our structures. What's the charge on that oxygen in our other resonance structure? Zero. So let's add that charge to it. How many structures do we have here? What's the average? What did I do to the charge by drawing a resonance structure? I reduced it. I made it more neutral. What does that do to stability? Increases stability, which means what about the acidity of that hydrogen? More acidic. Okay. What does that also do to the reactivity of that carbon? also going to reduce the reactivity of the carbon because what's happening is we're pushing electrons through that carbon. Okay? So while carbon may have the partial positive charge due to the inductive effect of those oxygens pulling it away, resonance helps stabilize that oxygen because the electrons are staying in that locality, floating over the carbon. Okay? Kind of tricky. So... I definitely saw a couple questions um, or people thinking at least what's the difference between these two structures because they sure look the same. Yes and no. And I'm hoping that I don't get into the material that's going to shoot me in the back on this one. Okay? Um, when we're looking for resonance, we freeze the structure. We cannot pick it up, rotate, spin, flip, anything like that. Okay? If that is the case, is this oxygen different from this oxygen? Yeah, this one's lower and on the right side. This one's higher and in the middle, okay? So when we evaluate resonance structures, you may end up finding that resonance structures will look very, very similar to each other. It's not always the case, but in most of them, they look very similar. And that's because what we've done to evaluate if it's resonance is we've frozen that structure in space. These are technically two different representations of the same molecule. I know it's a bit tricky. Okay. Questions? Okay. We're still going to deal with this, though. I'm going to erase it all here in a second and draw it again. <coughs> Take a look at the example that's actually directly being talked about here. That looks messy. Let's try that again. So we're going to take acetic acid, and I'm going to react it this time. 
with ammonia. Okay, as far as the names go, how many of you knew those were the names of these compounds? Okay, how many of you think that I'm going to expect you to know that these are the names of those compounds? Oh, really? I'm not going to expect you to know that these are the names of the compounds. That's a bit mean. Okay, so we've got so actually acetic acid you'll need to know. That's a lie. Ammonia, I wouldn't stress about. Okay. Chapter 2, um, in particular some of the homework problems I asked you to do, will give you two things and ask you to react them with each other and predict what the products are and then do a bunch of labeling stuff. Okay. I'm going to go through and do this kind of fast because I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, as far as what you'll need for the class. Okay? So when we go through and look at this, we want to treat it and try and determine our biggest positives and our biggest negatives. We just went through and looked at acetic acid. And our acetic acid, our big hint was that we were looking at our hydrogen. And we said, what is that hydrogen going to become? Positive. Which means the electrons between the oxygen and the hydrogen are going to go to the oxygen. So we already kind of looked at all that. We want to come up with some way to now stabilize that hydrogen. So everything we looked at previously was just kind of drawing structures just to see what could happen. Now we're pushing the full reaction. Since we've identified that hydrogen as positive, what do we need to find in our next structure? We need to find electrons. So which atom in that structure is the most negative? Nitrogen. Why is nitrogen the most negative? So there's a couple big things. One, highly electronegative. And two, it has the lone pair to be able to share. Okay? So there's our negative. What do we do in a reaction? We found our positive. We found our negative. Let's put them together. We're going to put them together with arrows. Okay? So we want the nitrogen hooking up with the hydrogen. Where does our arrow go? Hydrogen side or nitrogen side? Where did our electrons start? On the nitrogen, and they moved to the hydrogen, which means our arrow needs to go on the hydrogen side. What's the result of this? We've now formed a bond. We draw out our product. Again, the CH3 didn't change, but of course I decided to change it anyway. Let's try and be consistent. There's our CH3. We didn't touch our carbon-oxygen double bond. Our oxygen picks up an extra lone pair and a negative charge. What happened to our hydrogen? The bond is broken between the oxygen and, and hydrogen, and we've now formed a bond between the hydrogen and nitrogen. We didn't touch the other bonds to our hydrogen, so we'll draw those on. Okay. Are we done? No. We drew effectively the Lewis structures. I kind of half cheated and gave us the formal charge here. Okay, half cheated for a reason. You may start to work enough problems that you, every once in a while, say, hey, I know what the formal charge is. I don't have to worry about it. Okay. There's something that you can do to check. Can we create or destroy matter? No. What's the charge in my reactants? Zero. Overall charge, zero. What's the charge in my products right now? Negative one. What does that mean? I created electrons somehow. Again, Nobel Prize worthy. We need to fix it, which means there's got to be a positive charge in here somewhere. You have to go back through and find it. That positive charge is on the nitrogen. And we've ended up with our products. Okay. This is in the acid-base chapter, so we want to kind of go through and start to label things as acids and bases. We could go back to our reactants. What was acetic? It was acetic what? Acid. acid. What do you think it acted as? An acid. Probably an acid. What do acids react with? Bases. Bases. So what do you think ammonia is? Base. Okay. Remember we said organic chemistry goes forwards and backwards. So let's take a look at the reverse reaction now. If I try and go backwards... What does this species act as? I go from NH4 to what? 
I go to NH4 to NH3, right? What did it do to do that? It had to lose a hydrogen, so it acted as an acid. What do acids react with? Bases. So what are our other species? There's our base. Now I ask you, point to the acid. Got kind of a problem. Which answer am I asking about? Okay. By definition, we've established that our acids and bases will only refer to on our left-hand side, which means we need to come up with a new name for our products in this case, or what we would presume to be our products. Okay. That new name has to still maintain some of the knowledge that we know about it, that they're acids and bases. So what we're going to do is keep our acid base name, but then add an extra little phrase, conjugate. Since we've been completely inappropriate so far tonight, might as well push it. Conjugal visits. You're looking at someone in theory you're related to. NH4 is most related to NH3. So if I asked for the conjugate partners, those two are conjugate partners of each other. What does that mean about the other two? Also conjugate partners of each other as well. Okay? So we've addressed some nomenclature in that with the naming of what's going on with each of these pieces and a little bit of the reactivity. Okay? As we push into more advanced chemistry, we'll continue to look at these positives and negatives. It's ultimately the same idea all the way through. Okay? The rules are going to change a little bit, get a little bit more in depth, because certain things have to switch around. Okay? But we're ultimately following the same pattern. Okay? Go through and practice these. There are plenty of these practice problems in the homework. Okay. So... So much for spending no time doing it. Hey, so we can go through and do some weak, weak, weak acid examples. So I've got the rules up there at first. So what we can go through and try and do is rank acidity in each of these. So if I was going to compare HF to HCl, okay, we've got our hydrogen that's acidic. Thankfully, in that first case, there's only one in each case. So what I need to do is try and figure out which of those is most willing to give up the hydrogen. Which one's more acidic? HCl. Why is it HCl? Got a couple good answers on this one, too. What is HCl? Strong acid. Is HF one of those strong acids? No. So which one's the stronger acid? HCl. Okay, so now we know the answer. Why is that the answer? Okay, what we need to do is go back through our rules and try and figure it out. Okay, we could look at resonance. Resonance means pushing electrons from uh, lone pairs into pi bonds. Do we have any bonds that we can push around in? No. Said so we'll skip inductions. We won't stress about that one until we get to like the fourth example. Electronegativity. Is there a difference in electronegativity between fluorine and chlorine? Yes. Which one's more electronegative? Fluorine, which according to our rule would mean what about HF? The stronger acid. Hmm. It's a bit puzzling because we just said HCl was the strong acid. Okay. Maybe there's a reason for the numbering behind our rules. Electronegativity is rule number two. What's rule number one? Size. What's the difference between fluorine and chlorine when it comes to size? Chlorine is massive. Okay? That difference in size is what's going to trump electronegativity in this case. HCl comes out as the stronger acid. Okay? So make sure you apply your rules in the correct order. Start easiest, size, then electronegativity, then induction if you have to, then resonance. Okay? Um, let's take a look at... Um, what the heck? Let's just jump to the middle. Okay, these two. What's the first thing that we should do? Okay, we could look at the size. It's going to be a bigger issue with this. 
bigger than size. Sorry. <laughs> okay. What's that? Whether well, it's an acid or a base. No. We're assuming acid. I'm asking you to rank based on acidity, but that's not a bad idea. Make sure you answer the question asked. Well, you're, you're not sure what their structure is. So the biggest issue is going to be structure. We don't have the structure for these things yet. So it makes sense to look at our structures. So if we draw this out, there's CH3OH. I'll even draw on the lone pairs. Okay, what's the next biggest issue with that? Nope. You could, but not relevant to the question I'm asked. How many different hydrogens are on that structure? We've got a bunch of different hydrogens there. Which of those hydrogens is the acidic one? The one on the oxygen. Is everybody comfortable jumping to that answer? And is that why everybody's like, what is he asking about? Okay. We have to make sure we're ranking the correct acidic hydrogen. Okay. If we had decided to look at the hydrogen attached to the carbon, we'd have a bit of a problem trying to go through and solve this, because that's not our most acidic one in that case. Okay. When we move to the next structure, this is really only here um, as an example, because you'll see this show up. This is the structure of it, that formula that's given there, that condensed formula, is referring to that structure. If you didn't know that, that makes this problem a lot more difficult. Okay? Which is our most acidic hydrogen in that structure? The one on the oxygen because electronegativity, rule number two. We now compare between these two structures. We go through and look where our charge is going to end up. What atom is going to be negatively charged? The oxygen. So we're comparing oxygen here <coughs> and oxygen over here. So if it gives up the hydrogen, there's our negative. And there's our negative. So we can look at size. Is there a difference between the oxygen sizes? So ox one oxygen, different size from another oxygen? No. Is there a difference in electronegativity between oxygens? No. Can we look at an inductive effect? We could kind of pull the inductive effect on this one, which is why I put induction typically higher than resonance. Okay? We have a second oxygen there in the case of uh, our second structure. That oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. It starts pulling some of the electron density away from carbon, which means carbon starts to steal it from the other oxygen. Oxygen steals it from the hydrogen. Remember, that's a painful thing to kind of reason through with our inductive. So we could jump to resonance. And our resonance argument, we'd put a negative charge in this oxygen, and we'd end up with those same resonance um, structures that we just drew out for acetic acid. Okay? Kind of makes sense? So which one ends up being our stronger acid? Right or left? The right ends up being our stronger acid because we can stabilize that negative charge. The negative charge is stabilized. The hydrogen's more willing to come off and act as our acid. Okay? Because of resonance. Okay? The very bottom there is a bit difficult to go through and rank. It's ultimately trying to get you to compile all of those. I kind of want to push through uh, a few more pieces of information, ultimately getting into functional groups. Uh, I will mention that this ba no, that's a lie. You should be able to do that bottom one. Okay? So if you've got multiple things that you have to rank, where should you start? Pick any one you want to start with, and you need to compare it to any one of the others. Okay? Ultimately, you want to look for patterns as best you can. So we could go through and say, first off, HCl... Strong acid. So if we're going to rank acidity, that one's absolutely the strongest. Okay, so let's say one is the strongest. Okay. So we want to now compare that to any of the others. H2O absolutely has to be less acidic than one. Okay. 
So since we've got that one set aside, let's go ahead and ignore that and just move into the other cases. Okay, if we compare water to CH3F, okay, where's our acidic hydrogen and H2O? Either one, it's attached to the oxygen. So our negative charge is on what element? Oxygen. Compare that to CH3F. Where's our hydrogen? On a carbon. So we're looking at a negative charge on a carbon versus a negative charge on an oxygen. What's the difference between oxygen and carbon? Oxygen's more electronegative. We do not have a size effect, which means what about acidity? Our water should be more acidic than CH3F. Do we not have a size effect because they're similar in size? Because we're running along a row. We'll look where the negative charge is. Carbon and oxygen are in the same row of the periodic table. And that was one of the things that we talked about before. Within a row, we are assuming that our size does not change enough to contribute. Okay? If we move to the very last one, we just looked at that. That's this functional group, okay, which we'll talk about, I think, on the next slide. This functional no group is known as, who's done quiz two? Close carboxylic acid which means probably more acidic than CH3F, and it's probably more acidic than water, because water isn't even called an acid. So if we were going to go through and rank these, we would get one, two at the end, three for water, four for CH3F. Okay. You'll notice we had to do different rules to go through and try and apply our rankings to kind of determine what's going on with it. Okay? There are cases where you won't be able to decide where the charge or which one's more acidic than what. Um, those kind of problems I try to avoid asking. If it shows up on an exam, just raise your hand and say, hey, I think you might have goofed on this one. I'll take another crack, crack at it and make sure that it's solvable. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. So this kind of gets into our functional groups. When we start changing atomic structure, what different atoms are connected to other atoms, it changes our individual reactivity. All of these functional groups we are going to talk about this semester to some extent or another. Okay. So I know that looks a bit daunting. But you should be able to go through with each and every single one of these and say this atom's positive, this atom's negative. Okay? Why should you do that? Because that starts to identify your patterns for reactivity. Okay? If you're comfortable going through and identifying which one's most positive and which one's most negative, what's going to be the next step? Does it act as a Bronsted acid, Bronsted base, Lewis acid, or Lewis base? Start to define all of those possible reactivities. Why is that important? If you find out that you've got a Lewis base, what do you need to react it with? A Lewis acid. Okay? So knowing those definitions and applying them to the functional groups can really help as far as getting through a lot of the overall reactions that you'll see this semester. Okay? So let's take a, a kind of stroll through some of these and kind of name them out. See how many of you guys have already figured out. We start in the upper left-hand corner. CH4 is an example of that functional group. This functional group is an alkane, the A-N-E ending. Take a guess at pre, uh, reactivity. Reactive, not reactive. Not reactive because carbon-hydrogen bonds or carbon-carbon bonds. We're looking at covalent bonds. No difference in charge. Alkanes are typically unreactive. If you move into a more advanced class, um, we can show you how to make them reactive. But it usually involves some nastier chemistry. Okay? If we move to the next functional group, okay, these get named as a class alkyl. Any idea why we might say alkyl? We'll come back to that. We'll call them alkyl halides. Halide sounds an awful lot like 
are halogens. So if we've got a chlorine, as we do in this case, the chlorine will get called chloro or chloride. Okay, if it was fluorine, what would we call it? Fluoro or fluoride. If it was iodine, iodo or, I or iodine, the iodide, sorry. Okay. Our next functional group, probably the most painful in my opinion because of all the chemistry that comes out of them. And for the day after, um, we've got our alcohols. Down below that, we won't spend a lot of time on these two groups, um, but they will show up every so often. We have amines and ethers. Okay, The amine, I kind of want to point out, if we take a look at what's attached out there, it says carbon comma hydrogen. So what I'm saying is if you've got a nitrogen in your structure and it's connected to either carbons or hydrogens, it's referred to as an amine functional group. Okay, So if I have uh, carbon bound to NH2, that's an amine. If I go through and say instead it's now NH with our other bond to a carbon, that's still an amine. Okay, I can take it even further, get rid of that last hydrogen, bound that to another carbon. It's still an amine functional group. Okay, just to kind of classify that. Oh, no. Next slide, wink. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, the next functional group, another one of the difficult ones because of all the functionality that can come out of them. We get your alkenes. You'll notice in the Lewis structure that I gave here as a line, you don't see the double bond. Okay, You don't see the double bond because it can be implied from the lack of hydrogens being shown. Okay? You can sometimes also see it represented in there. Same deal with the next functional group. You don't see it there. We can imply uh, the presence of a triple bond, which is an alkyne. Um, the ring there will be our arenes. Primarily, we're concerned um, with benzene as the example. That's actually what's shown here. You might also hear them referred to as aromatic. Our other functional groups. So I also try to go through and show some abbreviations, particularly with these last few, because those can be confusing. If you see CHO anywhere in a structure, okay, it's typically going to show up at the end of a, a formula or a line. What it's referring to is this functional group here. Okay, that is known as an aldehyde. I can spell aldehyde. It's pretty close. Next one, we've got a ketone. Usually the abbreviation there isn't quite as bad. Um, you'll see parentheses saying that that oxygen is only bound to the carbon in front of it. If you don't have the parentheses starts to look like an ether. Pick the bad formula for an ether here. Okay. And then the last one will be our carboxylic acids. Okay. I would recommend that you use this slide to kind of reference your functional groups, particularly for any questions that I ask on the quiz, um, as opposed to your textbook. Because your textbook, I think, classifies them kind of confusingly. Um, you'll notice that there are patterns within these, in particular for those last three. Carbon-oxygen double bond, carbon-oxygen double bond, carbon-oxygen double bond. So those three get classified as carbonyl containing compounds. The carbonyl is the carbon-oxygen double bond. If that carbon is bound to an OH, we're looking at a carboxylic acid. If our carbon in the carbonyl is bound to two carbons, we're looking at a ketone. Okay? So we can start adjusting what functional groups are nearby. When we start to combine functional groups, we change the reactivity. Our carboxylic acid is a combination of a carbonyl and an alcohol. 
changes the chemistry so much about that hydrogen that we call it a carboxylic acid. Okay. Um, when we actually get into determining the chemistry of each of these functional groups, we'll talk a little bit more about their nomenclature. Um, but just as kind of a jump out, uh, this pretty much summarizes all nomenclature. Okay. We might even get to the more fun slide that looks at this. A um, couple of things that you're going to need for the next exam. Okay, and we'll get into more details for the next exam. But the big one is the number of carbons. If you've got a carbon chain, okay, you need to be able to refer to that carbon chain as opposed to saying six carbons. Okay, you need to tell me hex, pent, but, pent, prop, eth, meth. Okay? Your homework will ask probably up to deck, maybe even a little bit further. You can refer to your textbook to get the rest of those nailed down. When it comes to the exam, I'll only test you up to hex, okay? just because I don't think it's important to memorize the rest of them. Okay? Um, in the middle there, we've got uh, a priority of naming your functional groups. Okay? So for an individual structure, we can have multiple different functional groups in it. We have to name each of those functional groups. One of the things that's nice about nomenclature is it has very, very strict rules about how to apply uh, the nomenclature system, um, much better than, say, biochemistry, you need to be able to name the, your structure according to your highest priority functional group. Okay? So you've got all the functional groups listed on here um, with some of how you would change the name of your overall structure. Again, when we get to those functional groups, I'll show you how to apply them, but that should help you start to do some more advanced stuff, maybe even on your own. Hopefully I won't have to teach it to you. Okay. The next big rule is putting it all together. You're going to want to go through and find your longest carbon chain. Name it appropriate to the suffix that we just addressed over here. Identify your functional group. Ah, oh, I didn't edit this. Um, this one was modified from looking at, I think, aldehydes. Uh, you'll go through and name it your ending. What's the ending? Suffix? Okay, you'll put the final end on your prefix uh, according to whatever functional group it is. So if it's just carbons and hydrogens, the ending changes to an ain. Okay? If we throw in a triple bond in there, the ending changes to ein or ein and so on. Okay, like I said, I thought that's odd too. I just saw that. But apparently... I would have figured it was the other way around, too. Okay. Um, I will fix this in future slides. Um, we'll come back to how you name alkanes in probably just a few minutes here, before the end of class, I would guess. Branch structures. Branches also get to get or have to get named according to these same rules. But if it's a smaller branch than the main chain, we can't use the same endings. So we'll tweak the endings ever so slightly, and they'll get their suffixes will become YL. Okay, so you end up with methyls or ethyls if you've heard those phrases before. Um, and then when you go through and number your structure, you always want to number it so that you get the lowest number possible. Okay, pretty sure in the next few slides we've got an example of this. Okay, the next chapter is alkanes. Okay. Like I said, I think we're going to hit nomenclature here, um, sort of. One of the big things when it comes to structure, and in particular our alkanes, our alkane chapter is going to be relatively short, but it's going to be focused a lot more on structure. Okay. We're going to follow that up with probably the hardest chapter, which is stereochemistry, which is even more structure. Okay. After that, we'll start to move into reactivity. Okay. So one of our big primary consequences of our alkanes is that hybridization is sp3. Okay? So when we look at a sigma bond, we said that we can freely rotate the atoms around that sigma bond because the overlap, the bond overlap, doesn't change, okay? which means we get that free rotation. So if we take a look at a model kit, we said this structure was ethane. 
one of the things that you notice is that you can spin one of the ends. And that's not just because that's this model, that's how it works in the actual molecules as well. Okay? We're going to look at some repercussions of that that'll be a bit of a pain, but I kind of wanted you to, to get an idea of what's happening with that. Okay? The next big issue with it, when you look at the structure in this case, you see one view. Okay? Let's say it's molecule A. What happens if you draw it like this? Does the drawing look different? Yes. Yeah. Is it the same molecule? Yes. yes. How about that? Yes. Each of those different views <coughs> generate a slightly different perspective, and it's very easy to get them confused and think you're looking at a different structure. Right? So we have to come up with a way that we can label and identify our systems Okay? And that's where we come up with these terms. I'm going to show you a flow chart in a second that allows you to apply a lot of these. Okay? When we say different, we're referring to something very, very specific. A compound or two molecules that are different have different molecular formulas. Okay? That's the only time they're different. So go through and take it all the way down to the condensed formula. If you have a different number of atoms, they're different compounds. Okay? Identical. In that case, you've got the same formula, and <clears throat> your structures are superimposable. And that's where this can get kind of tricky. Okay, let's see. Let's pull this off. So, superimposable. Okay, there's one molecule. Here's a second molecule. Are they superimposable? So, by super... Stop spinning. That's why it was saying. By superimposable, if we try and overlap those, we can see all the bonds. So we would say, oh, no, those aren't superimposable, except these are three-dimensional molecules. What can I do with these three-dimensional molecules? Do they superimpose? Yes. Okay. So superimposing is taking those three-dimensional, or the two-dimensional structures, converting them into three dimensions, manipulating them, and trying to answer questions about it. Okay, and that's where it becomes tricky. So if you're good with three-dimensional systems, um, a lot of... Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. This chapter and chapter 6 isn't that bad. Okay? If you are bad with three-dimensional systems, you're not alone. Um, I'm personally one of the people that are bad with three-dimensional systems. And a model kit can become really, really helpful. Okay? Um, the next kind of break, we can go through and look at isomers. Our formulas will be same, will be the same, but the structures won't be superimposable. Okay? So something will have changed about that compound, preventing you from superimposing it on another. Like I said, we'll look at an example. There are branches of the isomer tree. You can end up with constitutional isomers or structural isomers. Um, in that case, the atoms are connected differently. Okay, that one's a little bit easier to reason through. The hard one, which is all chapter 6, the atoms are arranged spatially different. That one's a lot trickier. Okay? And that one has further branches within it. So, what we can do is take this information, put it into a flow chart, and try and apply it as best we can. So, given any two molecules, we'll try and pass through the flow chart and try and interpret what's happening here. So let's take a look at the upper right. Those two molecules. Okay. Do they have the same formula? Okay. So some people that have had a lot of practice with this might know the answer. Those of you that don't, what's probably the best option? <coughs> Fill in the hydrogen. How many bonds are shown, or how many carbons are in this structure, first off? We've got four carbons. C4, hey, they're the same. We shouldn't stop there. Make sure you count everything out. How many bonds are shown to our first leftmost carbon? Bonds shown? One, which means we have three hydrogens that are out there. How about our next carbon? We have two bonds shown, which means we have two hydrogens two hydrogens, three, we get a total of 10. Let's move to the next structure over. How many bonds are shown to that carbon? Two, two which means 
H2, 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 H2. How many hydrogens? Our formula is the same. No. If our formulas are not the same, that's where we follow our no across. The relationship between those two structures is they are different. Okay? I know that kind of seems simple. So let's move to the next example. Okay, these two. Do the same kind of reasoning through it. Same molecular formula. Yes or no? Yes. I only heard one answer. I want to hear a couple more than that. Yes. Saying a head shaking no, which I might accept as a no, just to make sure we clarify it. The hardest part on this one is going to come with that center carbon. How many bonds are shown? Three. There's a hydrogen there. The formula for that compound is C4H10. Each of the outer carbons has three hydrogens attached to them. We go through over here. This has the same formula as that, C4H10. Same formulas. Okay. Are they superimposable? Okay. No. There's no way that I can spin, rotate, or flip either of those two structures such that I can overlap them on top of each other. How do I know that? Kind of okay with three dimensions. And I wrote the question. Okay. So you're not going to be able to superimpose those, which means we move over into the isomers. So then we can look at the same atom connectivity. There's another rule we can go by here that's not going to work quite yet because we haven't talked about. Nomenclature is trying to name it. Okay. Our first rule of nomenclature is identifying our longest chain. Okay. Our longest continuous chain. And what we'll end up doing is circling it. So if we take a look at that first one there, I want to circle our longest continuous chain. So I'm going to highlight. There's our first carbon. Very clearly we've got at least two carbons in our longest continuous chain. Where's the next one? doesn't really matter. There we go. Three carbons in our longest continuous chain. Move to the next one. There's our first carbon. Second. Longest continuous chain is four carbons. Okay. If our name changes, they don't have the same atom connectivity. Okay. So what we've got here are structural isomers. The last yeah, the last example I kind of want to end on here. Let's look at the cross between these. What's the relationship between those two? They have the same molecular formula. Yes. yes. Are they superimposable? Yes. Yes. We can rotate about that bond to flip those structures so that they're superimposable. How do you know that? Again, you're either comfortable with the three dimensions or you're playing with a model kit to get comfortable with it. Okay? Um, these questions or everything that we've covered so far will get you through... Question five on quiz three. Um, so we'll probably make that do uh, Wednesday, next Wednesday. Okay. Um, if you've got questions, feel free to ask. I'll get the slides.